everyone. Um, welcome to this session where we're going to discuss some of the stuff that would uh, hopefully enable us to build things, uh, increase our velocity while keeping the security and the safety of the data of our users in the back of our minds. So we all know that the demand for speed and innovation is everywhere. Users nowadays no longer wants to wait for weeks, days to get their bug fixed, their new feature improved, the UX improved. The more you can ship the, feature, uh, fe the features to the users, that means the more retention, the more uh, increased engagement, and that means better numbers for your business, obviously. However, that enthusiasm to move fast create some issues and sometimes uh, create like a, it doesn't work really well when it's security, especially traditional one, which favor the status quo. And uh, it, this, uh, the aim to go fast can create some kind of challenges, like from a security perspective, obviously, like you can skip some processes and inefficient testing and so on and so forth. And we all know about some companies that was, were bragging about moving fast and they hit a roadblock because like, they forgot about security. And once the security is hit, uh, the trust between you and the users is actually lost. So we spend a lot of uh, time trying to build that trust back, but it's unfortunately gone. So DevOps is definitely desired. It enables us to move fast, increase the velocity, ship things faster, and make our users happy and uh, make our managers and uh, yeah, everyone happy. And the security is definitely required. We want to keep the data of our users safe. We want to keep this, the data of our customers safe. And that's what the DevSecOps brings to the table. So DevSecOps, what, what it tries basically is to save a seat to everyone in the table. It tries to keep, give the developers the freedom to ship things faster uh, add new features, fix bugs, and yeah, add business logic as uh, fast as possible. And enable the operations to once this, once the developer push the artifact, to generate the artifact and push it to production as soon as possible. But it also save a seat in the table for the security people to make sure that the software that we release, our releases, are actually safe and secure. So you may you figure it out by now what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be basically about Formula One. Uh, anyone, have, how much of you watched the Formula One Drive to Survive? Wow, quite a crowd, cool. So, very briefly, Formula One Drive to Survive is a Netflix documentary slash series that tells the behind the scenes of the Formula One in a, yeah, a dramatic way. Uh, yeah, very engaged and it keeps the suspense very high and it keeps the adrenaline very high, but it's, it's really cool. And motorsports in general are very dangerous. Uh, if you have been to a race before, in the badge it says that the motorsport is dangerous. It says so in, in the tickets and the badges and the t-shirts that everyone wears in the pit line. And to make the Formula One safe, it's a multi-layered, multi-generational task that the FIA, which is like the entity behind uh, the Formula One and that oversees it, tries to actually solve. So back to this documentary, while watching the drive to survive in the 2020 season, this accident actually happened. Uh, so Roma, which is a driver from the Haas team, uh, tried to overtake and then lost uh, control over the car and the car instantly uh, hit the barrier, turned it into a fireball and the car split into two. Now, by any measures, this is a death sentence. This is a fatal accident that probably nobody will get safe from that one. But what happened is actually a miracle happened. Not only he managed to get safe, but he managed to get out of the car by his own. He stayed there for a couple of seconds, but then he managed to get out of the car saying it's safe by himself. He had a couple of uh, scratches, but nothing dangerous. And that got me thinking. The Formula One people, the engineers there, might be doing a lot of things right to keep the safety of the driver, even of 
such dramatic and tragic accidents. And that got me to the question, what would happen if we started to design our systems, our architecture, our uh, softwares with the same level of devotion as the Formula One people, as the engineers, and everyone that is involved in the motorsports industry, design the cars and the races, um, and yeah, the pit lanes and everything to make sure that uh, the safety of the driver is the number one priority. Now, what I not noticed throughout the whole uh, documentary is they actually don't uh, mention security a lot. They talk about safety more. And that got me thinking because I'm not an Eng a native English speaker. So what's the difference between the two? So when I look at it in the dictionary, I found that security means the state of being free from danger or threat. Now, in the software industry, we know that when we put a software facing the internet, an application, it's no longer safe. It's no longer free from danger or threat. There are hundreds of million things, uh, hundreds of malicious users that try to attack your system, break your system, and seal the data of your users, or just like make it like a stationary uh, node to attack other systems. However, safety means the condition of being protected from danger, risk, or injury. And this is kind of what we're trying to achieve. We know that our, when, once we put our system in the internet, there are some malicious users, there are some uh, things that will try to break our system. But we try to minimize the damage, we try to, to keep our application up and running, make it safe, and even if an incident happened, we try to minimize the damage of our application. So that got me thinking that actually, if we want to design good architecture, we should enable the ID people, developers, security people, uh, operators to move as fast as possible, but in a safe manner. Now, rest assured, I'm not gonna propose like the diff safe, ops, whatever, the name is bad enough by itself, but I am boarded into a journey to check actually what are the safety measures that the Formula One people introduced and use to ensure the safety of the drivers? And if there are any lessons and best practices that we can adopt in the software uh, industry as well. And in this talk, we're gonna check 10 measures. Five of them are pre-safety uh, measures, like the things that they ensure before the drivers start racing or before the car crash. And five of them are post-crash measures, which are basically the things that they do once there is a crash. And checking the data, it actually works. So the first graph is the number of deaths uh, compared to the introduction of new measures. And you see, as we, the Formula One and the FIA started to introduce more safety measures, the number of thread Oh, number of death, sorry, has actually decreased. And the latest one was on 2014 in the Japan Grand Prix. Also, the number of days of fatal incidents has also increased the more safety measures they introduced. And, okay, and you could probably think in that the Formula One people, the people that they actually do everything to ensure the safety of the driver might get inspired from their IT department, you could actually, uh, can be inspired from the car engineers. It turns out, not really. So even the people that excels in, in safety and security from uh, a car engineering point of view, or a race car engineering point of view, struggle to make their system secure. But nevertheless, moving on. So as I mentioned, the first five are what we call pre-crash measures. The things that we do, or the Formula One people do to ensure the safety of the driver before the crash. And the first thing is they have a seat belt that is a six point harness which can be released by the driver by a single hand movement. So the seat belt is, it can't be uh, done or squeezed by the driver. It needs to help from the pit line people. And it's uh, uniquely tailored for each driver to fit his shape and also to ensure a little bit of comfort and a lot of safety during the race. But the driver during the race, if anything happens, it can only click on one button and the 
harness will be actually released and this is the equivalent of the push to release or the push to deploy in our industry right and that can be achieved through automation so automation is really important in our uh, software industry uh, things like chicken vulnerabilities can bring great value if they are automated so it can free up the security uh, team to look up for uh, other things we can automate manual things uh, given more time to our developers and ops people to and bring more value and more business logic to our developers. Moving on, the second thing they do is stranger dynamic, static and low test to ensure the safety of the drivers. And that means that they are testing the car in the different environments that the car could potentially be racing to during the race day. They test it when it's windy, when it's super hot, when it's, uh, when it's raining, different conditions that the car may experience during the race day. And they collect the data and check the security and the safety of the car. And the equivalent of that for us uh, in the IT sector is to have a trusted, repeatable, and most importantly, adversarial CI-CD pipeline. And that means that we are Trust, we are testing our application uh, in the same conditions it's going to be released and deployed to, to uh, our users. And adversarial here is really important since we are have, like, listening to everyone and making everyone's voice listen during the discussion. The developers, the ops, and also the security uh, people, not only after development but also throughout the whole process of releasing uh, our application another thing we can do is actually canary deployment and uh, canary deployment is actually not instead of releasing your new release to the the whole user base you select a subset of a user it can depends one percent percent whatever you prefer and then you release to only the subset of your user, your new application. So actually what would happen is sub, some of the users will go to redirection to the new release and the normal traffic or the majority of traffic will see pointing to the old release. And that will enable you to test effectively in production the behavior of your new release and have metrics that define if the error rate, the latency, whatever measure is important for you, if that uh, increased, then roll back uh, before it damages and it impacts more users. The third thing they have is they build the car around the cockpit. And the cockpit is a deformable crash protection structure. And this is how the cockpit basically looks like. And they build the car around this piece of infrastructure or piece of structure which sole purpose is actually to protect the driver uh, during the race and during the uh, incident. This is the equivalent of designing for failure. So we, especially developers, no longer should design our application for only functionality, but we should also design our application to be fault tolerant with full tolerance obviously in mind. We should design our application, especially if it's distributed systems, whatever architecture is you are using, um, having full to tolerance in mind, designing for failures regarding database, network, whatever that can break your application. Another thing is mutual TLS, making sure that the traffic circulating inside your cluster is actually uh, encrypted and you are many so the options that we can do that, uh, sidecar proxy like Envoy or other open source solutions that have been pro probably discussed in this uh, conference. But it is really important, especially in a distributed system, since both the client and the server in a distributed system are services. So mutual TLS will enable you that no connection will be permitted unless both clients are actually verified, which is really important from a security point of view in a distributed architecture. And the third thing, we, we can adopt like a micro, micro segmented, segmented architecture. And what it means is we are 
put in the service services responsible of or accessing the data as far away as from the internet as possible and put in some facets and proxy services in front of the internet. So what it means if an attacker manages to get access of one of the service or internet facing services, our architecture will basically deform itself to protect the data of our users in the same manner as uh, the car deforms itself in uh, the cockpit and that will enable to keep our data uh, safe. The fourth thing is before they race, driver must demonstrate they can get out of the car within five seconds and they actually test that. If you can't get out of the car under five seconds before the race, goodbye. You cannot race for the day. And this is not only designing for the worst case, this is testing for the worst case. Like imagine if an accident happened and the driver, the driver is still like con conscious, then he, he should get out of the car as fast as he can. So we're testing this scenario before actually the accident. And the equivalent of that is what we call uh, chaos engineering. We, in our systems, we all have, we all know things about our systems and we all know the things that we probably don't know well about our system. But what is, what scares us the most is the things that we don't know, we don't know about our systems. And those are the major incidents that we have. So chaos engineering is actually a practice that enable us to test in productions, in production because that's where the fun happen. That's where the user, your users get affected and that's where we have the most of your issues. Uh, and then uh, by that you can uncover bit by bit the unknown unknowns and reduce them and check how your system will behave in case of issues. And you can design it, you can start small and grow gradually. You can start by putting hypotheses on how your system actually should behave in case of a failure. Could be latency increase, could be uh, error, uh, error uh, a database outage, a network issue. And design the smallest possible failure to test and design what you would expect your system. And then um, do some measurement after that during the experiment. And once that's done, then you will have, uh, you will increase the resiliency and reliability of your system. You know how, how your system will behave. You can start, as I mentioned, small, like restoring delays or uh, errors, and then you can go wild, uh, removing a whole cluster. Uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. But yeah, that will enable you to understand your system and understand the resiliency of your system. And the fifth thing is constant monitoring and replacement of the tires. And check out this quick GIF. This is the world record of re replacing the tire in a, in a Formula One race. It's one second, 80, at one second, 82 milliseconds. And notice how happy they are, how proud they are. They manage it to change the tire in less than two seconds. Compare this to our attitude uh, in the way we deploy our applications. We're bragging uh, sometimes that our application is still alive for sometimes months, sometimes weeks, sometimes days. What would happen if we reduce the lifetime of our application and constantly replace uh, our application? Now, we are all familiar of the pits versus cattle analogy, and that basically means uh, in traditional uh, servers, be bare metal or VMs, we are used to keep our application alive as soon as possible. That means that we, we build personal relationship with our applications, with our servers. We try to keep them alive as soon as, uh, as much as we can. We fix them, we patch them, but we try to keep uh, the system up and running. And we can go even beyond that and give them names and so on and so forth. However, with the rise of the cloud, we change it to the way we treat our infrastructure to be more cattle, which means that resources are disposable. Uh, disposable. We spin it up at well and we kill them at well. Now, if we accept this zoomophoric analogy of pits versus cattle, what would happen if we push it a little further to the 
chickens analogy, given that the maturity, uh, the time to reach maturity for the chicken is much more less uh, than compared to the pet, to the cattle, sorry. It's days compared to, or weeks compared to months for the pet. And that takes us to uh, some other metrics that also matters when it comes to the way we want to uh, monitor our service and the health of our service. The first thing is the reverse uptime. And this actually take an example. Imagine that you have an application running in a cluster and it's running mission critical applications. And now an, an attacker, a hacker, managed to get inside your node, inside your cluster. Now that is bad by itself. But he managed to uncover itself and use this node as a base to attack other systems or uh, to attack external uh, systems. Now, what would happen if your cluster or your node or your application is, act is actually constantly killing itself and restarting itself? What that means is that the attacker will need to do the same and repeat the same process each and every X amount of time. Let's see one day. So we need to do the same process to get to to try to get inside your cluster because once the application, once the node, once the uh, container, whatever it's removed, I would need to just repeat the same process. And the thing is, from a security point of view, we can't backdoor a system that is constantly revaged and revamped and removed. So from a security point of view, this is actually great. And this is uh, a great way. Now combine that with the base image freshness, which is the base image that you use to deploy Oriole applications. And from a security point of view, once you update the image, and for that patch, it's say an important patch, Linux kernel, zero day uh, security issue, then you know that the longest amount of time that your application would send vulnerable is actually the reverse uptime. And the smallest and the shortest your reverse uptime is, the, sh the fastest the base image will be populated to your uh, cluster and that enable you to fix the vulnerability issue fast. So those were the fast pre-crash measures that they do. Now moving on to the post-crash measures. What happened once the car crashed and it's actually burning. So the first thing is the driver can be extricated from the car by lifting out the entire seat. And that means that the design of the car in a modular way enable them to, if a crash happened and the driver passed out and they couldn't get the driver out from the car, they lift out the entire seat from the car. Compare that to a normal car which is under stress and we try to break out the car and we lose some precious minutes, seconds, to save the driver's life. And modularity is really important in the way we uh, architect our applications. Think of how fast you can pull the plug on uh, a key that has been pushed to GitHub and been made uh, publicly available, a certificate that has been leaked, a lot of things. So, the more modular your system is, the more that will enable you actually to react in case of incidents. The second thing is the drivers wear a hands, and the hands stand for hand, head, and neck system that absorbs and redistributes forces that would otherwise hit the driver's skull and neck muscles. And this is how a, a hand system looks like. And it's basically if uh, a crash happened, instead of the forces go to the uh, driver's head, that would probably break his head or neck muscles, the hand system will basically take those forces and redistribute it throughout the whole driver's body. And from a software engineering point of view, that is the equivalent of having an elastic architecture. And there are a couple of things that we can adopt to uh, leverage that, starting by having load balancers. If a load increased, we, could, we can have like some load balancers that evenly distribute the traffic throughout our old node. Having auto-scaling uh, that can cope up with the increase of traffic and create additional nodes to handle the 
traffic. If one some of the services are starting to act small, we should have like request time thresholds that cut the connection to save uh, resources such as CPU and threads. Sorry. In some of the cases, it's really good to have some degrading performance. Uh, it depends obviously on the business, but having in some scenarios, having a degraded performance is um, really important than having a, a, a global outage. And finally, we can adopt some anti-overload patterns, such as like the circuit, circuit breaking and exponential backoff. That would help us if some of the services are started to behave uh, weirdly. Uh, the third thing is driver wear suits that are fire resistant and that keep the driver's body under 41 degrees Celsius, even in the extreme heat. And this is how Roma, our the driver that we started this talk with, managed to get out of the car. Even he was, if he was surrounded with the extreme heat, his body was under 41 degrees Celsius. And this is the equivalent of keeping the attackers in, uh, trying to contain the attackers in case, if, even if they manage to get access to our system, we can adopt some practices that will enable us to contain them and keep them and try to uh, keep the data of our users and customers safe. Starting with the least privileged principle, we should give our applications, container, cluster, whatever, the minimum set of access rights and resources that enable it to perform its function. Things like defense in depth and building layers of security, kind of like the onion architecture, that once an attacker manages to sneak in one of the layers, you will find an additional layer that will make his life a little bit harder and give you more time to react and fix uh, the vulnerability. And having a zero trust, especially in during uh, communication between uh, distributed services uh, and having no uh, implicit trust of the request. So making sure that uh, the request is, is what it pre pretended to be and making sure that it's valid before like starting processing the request is also really important. Another thing we can adopt is actually hardware security modules. So imagine that uh, you have an application that store some users information and you are basically hashing a pass password with, with whatever hashing encrypt systems or algorithm you are using. Now imagine that an attacker managed to get access to your database, seal the data and put it into without you knowing it basically. What he can do is he can like brute force, brute force to break the passwords and you won't notice until it appears a uh, couple of days later in the black market. Now, hardware security modules enable us to uh, have keys that with, with which we're gonna encrypt the password. And that means that the attacker, if he can manage, and the, those keys are really hard to break, they're unbreakable, and gonna spend uh, more than his life trying to break them. And that means that the attacker can no, no longer steal the data and put it away. He, that means that he will stay inside our cluster to at least get the keys to decrypt our passwords. And that will give you, trying to keep him in, that will give you some additional time to hopefully uh, uh, get, be aware that there is some attack happening on your cluster and react properly. The fourth thing is they have fire suppression system that can be activated by the driver externally or by the race, the race marshal. And what triggers me here is this distribution of roles. If, the, if a crash happened and the driver is still conscious, then he can uh, activate this system by himself. If the driver passed away and the, sec the safety team and the rescue team can get into the car, they can activate it by themselves. Now, imagine as our friend Roman, the car breaks into two and there is a fireball. So Roman, if Roman passed away, and there is the safety team cannot get in time, then the race marshal can activate it remotely. And in software engineering, especially in the way we define policies between our uh, systems, we need, we need to define communication policies and make sure that no uh, application 
can call other application if it's not allowed to. Having access control and defining role-based access can help to give access to only the people that need to access the resource. And finally, they have data records. And the Formula One people are crazy about collecting data. They collect data about everything. Uh, so they have data records that keep the speed and the solution forces so doctors know the severity of an impact. So the doctors, if an accident happened, they already know how severe the accident was and they know how probably what they would probably expect and they know how to react to uh, such accident. And no system should go to production without monitoring uh, in place. You should have login that uh, logs events, especially uh, security ones, having monitoring and observation tools in place that uh, give us uh, an understanding of how our system is reacting and behaving and uh, could potentially trigger alerts in case of malicious uh, behavior. And those were the 10 safety measures and their comparison uh, uh, in the software industry. But it's all about finding the right balance. It's a trade-off between the cost, what you are trying to achieve, and the security as well. And that is the philosophy that the Formula One people adopt as well. Uh, and they have two examples for that. The first one is the refueling. So the refueling was, so before what you were doing is actually they will start the race with, because the more fuel you have in your car, the more slow your car is in the fewer lap, in the, in the first laps. What they were doing is they have, they start the car with a little bit less ref fuel, and then they kept refueling the car with each and every uh, lap. And it was banned in 2009 because of potential risks. As you can see in the picture, drivers were actually uh, burning and of the cost. BBC reported that the cost of maintaining and refueling the car and all the people that handled the system is cost the teams over $1 million per year. So it was removed from both a security perspective and also from a cost perspective. And the second example is, this is how the drivers in, the, in a Formula One car look like. This is not comfortable at all. And they feel every bounce in the car. Um, but it's a trade-off to gain speed. Uh, so it's not comfortable, but it enables them to uh, gain speed and design the car with the aerodynamics to be uh, as fast as it could. And I want to end this presentation with some numbers from uh, the cost of data breach report by the IBM security folks. In 2020, 2021, they found that the average business cost of a cyber attack is more than 4 million. But the number that scares me most, scares me most is it takes over 200, 287 days to detect the breach. That's a long time. Um, so I hope that throughout this presentation, we have now, we have now some uh, good understanding of how we can move fast while keeping our system resilient and our data of our customers and users safe. Uh, some resources that helped me to build this presentation. And with that, I want to thank you if you have any questions. <laughs>